the Grand Canyon. It's grand, and it's a canyon, but it can also be a pretty daunting place. From the oppressive heat to even flash floods, the Grand Canyon can at times be dangerous. However, that doesn't include the terrifying, often unexplained things people have encountered there. So, prepare yourself. The following stories are allegedly true accounts of the scary things that people have seen at the Grand Canyon. Send me your scary stories for future episodes at darkstories.org. I'd love to hear scary stories from Yosemite National Park. Like this episode and subscribe if you want more scary stories. And if you like folklore, check out Freaky Folklore, a podcast about your favorite monsters and myths on iTunes, Spotify, your favorite podcasting apps, or just go to eeriecast.com. Now, let's begin. Things aren't what they seem at the Grand Canyon. From Tony 03. A long time ago when I was a kid, my grandpa used to take me out to hike on the trails at the Grand Canyon from time to time. He had married my grandma there, and he'd always found the setting fascinating and peaceful. Grandpa had always been a quiet, thinking man, and he did his utmost best to teach me things. The man fervently believed that level-headedness was the most important in any situation, and having both knowledge and wisdom together should be the goal of any good man. I respected him from the start, and went with him on any adventure I could. Hunting, fishing, climbing, all things my grandpa taught me. By the time I was 15, I was so sure that I understood that man. Then that understanding vanished within a single night. We were closing in on a night hike, nearly three quarters of the way back to grandpa's old pickup truck. Instead of finishing out the trail, he glanced at me and nodded his head toward the right. As he veered in that direction over a steep hill and directly through sparse patches of sagebrush, I followed without a word. Sure, I was curious, but I was dog-tired that evening and almost certain he just wanted to show me a plant I hadn't seen before. Before long, he sat at the crest of the hill and sat down in the dirt. I planted myself right next to him. He shushed me, though I hadn't said a word yet, then pointed down towards the shallow valley in the distance. There was a faint path there, and not much else. But my grandpa wouldn't just point for no reason. I glanced at him. He looked at me, then leaned in close, so I had a better look at where his finger was pointing. His arm, my compass, I soon located it. It looked like a black twig in the canvas that was this twilight scene. It appeared to be a person in the distance, the silhouette of one at least. Instinctively, I asked aloud, Who is that? A sharper shush from Grandpa reminded me that for some yet unspoken reason, we should not be talking right now. He only wanted me to watch. We must have sat there for an hour. My back was aching, and it was beginning to get chilly. I wanted to go home, but I knew better than to complain. After drawing my name in cursive in the dirt for the dozenth time, I looked up, and I saw that the figure had disappeared. There wasn't a place to hide in the distance anywhere. Where would that silhouette of a person have gone? I thought I'd see it again. Grandpa's voice, after such a long silence, made me jump. After composing myself and wiping the dirt from my finger, I noticed he was frowning. Wish I hadn't brought you tonight, but now you know it's there. Hesitant to speak, I forced out a question. What was it, Papa? Don't know, he sighed. The aging man wiped a stream of sweat from his forehead. It was too cold for sweat at this point. 
His hand quivered every inch of the way. My father showed it to me when I was little. He wasn't sure what it was either, but once it found us, he had no choice. Just looked like a man to me. Probably another hiker. My eyebrow raised. I'd never seen him so on edge over something so benign. Wish that was the case. Listen here, and listen close, son. He picked himself up off the ground and stretched his wary form. You'll see that figure on these hiking trails again. And when you do, you sit there in the dirt and you watch it. You watch it till it turns its back and walks away. And don't you look away until he's not there anymore. And come alone if you can. I smiled awkwardly, thinking he was telling me a weird joke of some sort, but the man's face was stern and cold. He was nothing but serious. Yes, sir, I replied. I watched a tear fall from his cheek. Suddenly, the old man stepped forward and hugged me tighter than he ever had. You're growing into a good man. Don't you ever let this horror of a world change that. Okay, Papa, I managed to say, choking back tears. I didn't really even know why I was crying. He cleared his throat as he pulled away, then nodded, just as he had before, letting me know we were headed back to the truck. The last thing I remember of that night was stepping out of the truck when he brought me home. He said something to me just after saying goodnight. I... I'm sorry I fell asleep back there. What? I hadn't even noticed he'd fallen asleep. I mean, I was so bored I'd perfected my name in cursive. Some poor hiker is going to find my dirt scrawlings, I thought, and wonder what kind of narcissist child lurked those trails. It's okay. I'm pretty tired myself. Have a good night, Papa. He smiled, nodded one more time, then drove away. Grandpa didn't wake up that morning. Doctors said his heart just stopped. Then and only then did I finally understand real heartbreak. He had been my only true friend, and with him gone I felt truly alone in the world. Mom and Dad were quick to remind me Grandpa had been in his 60s, that for their family, that was a full life. Men in our family are lucky to make it to their late 60s like Grandpa had. They explained to me that he was in a better place, but selfishly, I didn't want Grandpa in a better place. I wanted him here. Here, he could take me fishing again. He could laugh like he did whenever I asked him to bait my hooks for me, because the worms grossed me out. He could smile like he used to when Grandma was around to share an iced tea with him on the front porch. It's a dire realization for a person when you finally realize that everyone is destined to see their loved ones die. For a while, I was so upset that everything that reminded me of Grandpa, I avoided. After that, these things felt negative to me. So for years, I didn't rock climb, I didn't fish, I didn't hike, I didn't even drink iced tea anymore. In my mid-twenties, my mood began to change. Having met a girl, getting married, and having a child of my own on the way, I realized banishing myself from the things I loved most was the worst way to respect my grandpa's legacy and memory. These were things I wanted to share with my own kid. I manned up and planned a hiking trip with my wife, Vanessa. She wasn't too far in her pregnancy, where she shouldn't be moving around too much, but I would still need to do all the heavy lifting. Not a problem. Our trip to that very same hiking trail at the Grand Canyon I'd last been on with Grandpa was a pleasant one. The skies were clear, it wasn't terribly hot, and the trails were almost vacant. 
We planned to camp for the night at the peak of the trail, then circle back to the car in the morning. One night would be easy for both of us, I thought. The day passed by too quickly. My wife enjoyed the pleasant warmth and absolutely loved how much I recalled my grandpa teaching me, like the different names of various plants and animals we saw. But really, I think she was just happy seeing me so happy. At the thought of all the years spent away from this place, my throat became tight. I was happy, but I felt full of regret for staying gone for so long. We soon made it to the planned camping spot off the center of the trail. I prepared the tent, started a small fire, and prepared some camping MREs I'd bought at a Dick's Sporting Goods. I thought they looked tasty from the packaging, but in this case, you might actually want to judge a book by its cover. My wife nearly vomited from the meal, maybe partly due to the pregnancy, being sensitive to certain tastes and smells and all that. But my feelings were similar. After a bite of my turkey chili in a pouch, I spat it in the dirt and placed the remainder in the trash bag, double bagged it, and placed it tightly in my hiking bag. Instead, we ended up filling up on marshmallows. After that, we lay in the tent together, joking about terrible baby names, before she fell asleep. Not long after, I drifted off as well. Hey, there's someone watching us. My wife's voice, curious and soft, woke me. What? Uh, the sun's not even completely up yet, I grumbled. I said there's someone out there just watching us. He's just standing there like half a mile away from us. I was just about to place a pillow over my head to blot out the first ribbons of soft morning light when my eyelids shot wide open. Suddenly, I felt breathless. My heart seemed to be doing flips in my chest. I pushed myself off of my sleeping bag and I ran outside in nothing but boxer shorts. I found my wife standing, facing the sunrise, protecting her eyes with a hand on her forehead. When she heard me, she glanced at me for a moment and pointed. Look, over there. My stomach turned at the familiarity of the situation. I stepped over next to her and followed her finger her arm a dreadful compass, guiding me to something I refused to believe. There, on a distant, seldom-trodden path, stood a figure, like a dark twig sprouting from the horizon, exactly as I'd seen it all those years ago. Who do you think it is? she asked. Shh. Sweat drenched from my still-cold forehead. As if on autopilot, I sat on the ground and stared at him. He didn't move. What are you, hun? Sit and hush. I demanded impatiently, doing my best to not sound too disrespectful to my wife, who already appeared so confused. Can you blame her? Playing along, she whispered. What's going on? Who is that? I was horrified at the thought of saying too much. After all, I never did understand why Grandpa had wanted me to be so silent in front of this figure. So quickly, I thought of an answer that was short and to the point. One of the last things my Grandpa ever saw. Somehow it worked. Vanessa remained silent, waiting there on the ground with me. I could tell she was calm and patient but my insides felt like soup. With absolutely no idea as to why, I knew I had to listen to my grandpa's warnings. I sat there for two hours, staring at the figure, watching him, waiting for him, until finally he turned and began to walk away. I started to get up, but caught myself. I didn't take my eye off the figure until it faded right out of existence. It was as if it had never been there. I turned toward my wife. She was slumped over a bit, having fallen asleep at some point. 
guess she was still tired too. As my heart slowed, I began to make sense of it all as best I could. I'm sorry I fell asleep. My grandpa had said to me, the last thing he ever said to me. It wasn't some random needless apology. He had been sincere about it. He apologized. But for what? Because he fell asleep and stopped watching the figure. All while I had played in the dirt, not paying attention at all. With no one watching this figure, it had disappeared. But to where? Somehow I think my grandpa knew. I wholeheartedly believe that same figure came for him in the night and stole his breath away. And since I'd seen it, even as a child, it had now appeared to me again, and now my pregnant wife had seen it. The hike back to the car was the fastest hike I'd ever done, and easily the most stressful one. My mind reeled with questions. Would it return at any moment? Would it come back at a later time somewhere at our own home? What is the figure? On the drive back, I told my wife everything. Most importantly, I explained, if you ever see that figure again, stare at it until it's gone and do not look away. You see, I think that's the rule. If you see it in the distance, drop everything and stare until it disappears. Because if it disappears while you're not looking, it will come for you. After all, my grandpa's father had also never awakened from his slumber. I should have listened to my grandpa. I never should have come back or I should have at least come alone. But I think both my grandpa and I didn't take this thing seriously until it was too late. I can't help but worry. This will now carry on to our child that my wife carries. Grand Canyon Skeletal Figure from J. Ion My uncle and his wife decided to go on a tour of Western American states for their 15th wedding anniversary celebration. They first visited Hawaii, then Washington State, before going down south to Oregon, California, and then went eastward to Nevada, and finally Arizona. They, of course, visited the major landmarks and cities in each of those states, from Honolulu and the Volcanoes National Park to Yosemite, Los Angeles, Death Valley, and Las Vegas. My uncle and aunt enjoyed every moment of their trip. Everything was going according to plan, except for a small incident that, to this day, my uncle and aunt do not see eye to eye on. My aunt outright rejected whatever my uncle said. While in Grand Canyon National Park, their tour guide took them to a narrow trail that was near the cliff edge of one of the glens where they could see the flowing brook and its banks. My uncle walked about 25 meters ahead of my aunt, who was taking her own sweet time strolling at a leisurely pace while taking pictures of everything around her. He was practically alone on the trail as the people who walked ahead of him were at least 15 meters away. My uncle reached an area of the trail where it curves around a large bend at an almost 90 degree angle, so it created somewhat of a blind spot where he could not see what was in front on the trail, and after he passed the bend, he couldn't see what was behind him. He stood by the bend to wait for his wife. As she was taking a while to get to him, he started looking around the canyon. When he looked at the flowing brook at the bottom of where he stood, he noticed something walking from behind the bend on the bank of the brook. He was shocked to see a very tall human skeleton walking into plain sight. It was an off-white complete set of a fully grown adult skeleton with absolutely no flesh nor skin. Even the eye sockets were completely hollow. My uncle said he could see what was behind the skeleton through the gap between its ribs and pelvis. My uncle began yelling for his wife to come and look. As my aunt was still some distance away, and the trail was narrow and near a cliff edge, she could not just run towards him. 
He frantically turned his head to yell at her to hurry up and turned his head back to where he saw the skeleton and it was gone. There was no trace of it, not even footprints, nothing to indicate its existence. When my aunt finally caught up to him, she nervously asked what happened, thinking that my uncle was in an emergency. He stared with wide eyes while pointing at the spot where he saw the skeleton just moments earlier. He yelled over and over again that there was a skeleton there, a real skeleton walking by itself, a human skeleton. My aunt was flabbergasted. She told him that he might be suffering from heat stroke and imagining the skeletal remains of animals being reanimated as a result. My uncle repeatedly insisted that he saw what he saw, but my aunt rebutted by saying she was very certain that she saw nothing out of the ordinary along the trail and was sure my uncle was experiencing symptoms of heat stroke, dehydration, or exhaustion. After some time arguing back and forth, my aunt decided to drag my uncle to a meeting point at the end of the trail, where she asked their tour guide to provide some first aid to my uncle for heat stroke and dehydration. While the tour guide checked for injuries, my uncle told the tour guide what he saw. The tour guide very sympathetically replied that my uncle is not the only visitor who has experienced something unusual in the Grand Canyon. The tour guide explained that ever since the Grand Canyon was open to public visits, there have been reports of strange sightings and unexplainable encounters. Some people attribute the strange happenings to UFOs. Some believe that the ethnic cleansing of Native Americans by European settlers left an indelible mark on the land. While some think that the Grand Canyon is the location of an interdimensional doorway, or that it is the chosen home of supernatural beings, on account of its remote location, population scarcity, and extreme climate. When my uncle and aunt returned home from their trip, my uncle told relatives about what he saw, which my aunt will always counter with logical explanations. This has always been a point of contention for them, because my uncle and aunt rarely argue, and they're the most loving married couple most people know. To this day, after their 30th anniversary, my uncle and aunt still bicker about what happened in the Grand Canyon. My uncle even suggested that, for their 35th wedding anniversary celebration, they should go to the Grand Canyon a second time, in hopes that my aunt might catch a glimpse of the supernatural herself. Creeper at the Grand Canyon From Matthew If you have a weak stomach, or other problems like that, I suggest you avoid this story. It all started back in May of 2005. I was about eight years old when this occurred. My brothers, my dad and I were on our way to New Mexico for one of my dad's work meetings. We decided to stop by the Grand Canyon along the way for some lunch. When we got out of the car, my stupid little brothers decided to run off and go explore. My dad told me to go chase them down and bring them back to eat some lunch, so I did. I began yelling their names out, but they wouldn't respond. I walked for a while, probably five minutes, looking for them, when I came across this sketchy-looking trailer. I didn't go over towards it because of how disgusting it looked. Then finally, I saw my two little brothers, J and E. They both came running up to me, telling me that they saw something hiding under some sage. So, being the big brother, I looked around the area but saw nothing. I told my brothers that we had to go now, but as we were about to leave, I heard a raspy voice coming from the back door of the trailer. They said something along the lines of, Don't leave. I immediately took off with my brothers to my dad's truck. But the thing was, my dad was nowhere in sight when we got back. I assumed he was looking for me, for us, so I waited at the truck until his return. But 
About seven minutes later, I saw a figure walking towards us. It wasn't my dad. It was the person from the trailer. I wanted to tell him to screw off, something more aggressive or intimidating like that. But all that came out was a shaky, hello? The person did not respond, but instead, they pulled out a hunting knife and ran right towards us. I grabbed a hold of my two brothers' hands, and we jumped down a hill. Thankfully, the creep didn't jump down with us. Instead, he just stared. By this point, I was beginning to think this guy was some sort of alcoholic. He looked drunk as all heck. But just then, my dad comes running up to the creeper and hits him in the chest. The creep cut my dad on the arm, but my dad got the upper hand, socking him in the face. The man staggered and ran off, and thankfully, he never returned. After the police were called, they explored the area, and later that week found the man asleep in an alley somewhere. It wasn't far from where we were. My dad did not make it to his meeting, but he didn't care. Chupacabra at the Grand Canyon From Hexbro This is a short experience, but a rather creepy one. It was 12 years ago. I would have been 14, traveling the night roads through Arizona with my family. My mom and dad had planned a road trip that would take us close enough to the Grand Canyon to get out and see it for ourselves. When we passed it by, it was breathtaking. I had no idea just how deep and vast the Grand Canyon was until then. But I didn't get to see it long, and we weren't going to be able to get out and take a look as we'd planned. Because, suddenly, my dad screamed from behind the wheel. The SUV swerved and skidded to a stop, slinging my brother, my mom, and I toward the opposite end of the SUV. When the vehicle became motionless, my heart was pounding out of my chest and my mother demanded to know what on earth was going on. My dad, though, sat quietly, staring out the driver's side window of the SUV. Naturally, we all looked in the same direction, wondering what had stolen his attention and nearly caused us to crash. Well, we all soon saw it. It was standing halfway on the road and halfway on the dirt that surrounds the road. It was four-legged, a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen. Its shape roughly resembled a dog, but instead of fur, it had scales that glistened from the beams of our headlights, which, due to my dad swerving, were now aimed partially in its direction. Its mouth reminded me of a dog's as well, a long, thin maw. But there were visible teeth protruding from the sides, especially two unnaturally long ones at the front, just looking at those fangs made me shudder. And the color of the thing was terrifying too. Had our headlights not been on it now, or had the creature been standing in the middle of the desert, we never would have seen it. It was the color of the dirt, that reddish-brown color, built perfectly to hunt in this environment. The creature was obviously startled as much as we were, the thing's chest was heaving as it breathed heavily. It stared at us. No other part of it was moving except its chest, as if it was hoping to still be hidden. Nope, we could see it full and well. After a momentary staring contest, the creature half scurried and half galloped into the rocks and desert in the opposite direction. When I saw it retract from the road, chills ran up my spine because it almost entirely disappeared to my eyes, almost. We collected ourselves as Dad rushed us out of there into the nearest hotel we could find. There, we discussed what happened and even laughed about it. To this day, we tell this story to friends and family and wholeheartedly believe that what we saw was a chupacabra. Chupacabra.